yeah, I'm, I'm kind of uh, coming from a slightly different viewpoint from some of the other talks that you've heard. Um, we've got maybe an idea that formal training has to be the preserve of larger, more established commercial units who can um, put considerable resources into training schemes and have dedicated staff like Leo and Dave at MOLA. Um, however, working for a smaller unit can, I'm going to argue, provide uh, better opportunities for having consistent mentoring and for be being able to provide really diverse training experience. Um, faced with problems in recruiting experienced staff and the desire to encourage the next generation, um, Alan Archaeology devised a three-month training scheme which is aimed at getting people to that PIFA level of um, equivalent skills. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through what we do, what the rationale behind it was, a little bit about us, and some of the problems that we've encountered in putting it into practice. Uh, towards the end, you'll get to see some of the thoughts of our recent and current trainees, um, and I hope it's going to provide a bit of thought about um, for the discussion session on what, what smaller companies can actually do to help. Um, and also, I'd like you to have a think about the fact that this is a scheme that basically was designed to solve a very specific problem and to encourage, it was aimed at local university graduates, um, and yet we're getting applications from people with a huge variety of skills from both this country and from mainland Europe. I'm not going to claim we're perfect, in fact I'm going to be very open about what we're not good at, um, uh, and I'm not saying that this is rocket science either, but I'm hoping that um, I can show you that with a little bit of thought, it's possible for even smaller units to put together a robust training programme that's going to be of equal benefit to the trainee and to the company. So first off, a little bit about us, as I'm aware you might not know about the company. Um, Alan Archaeology has been going for 11 years now, started in 2005, very much a uh, I was going to say one man band, but I don't think the director would appreciate that. Um, <laughs> there were, um, two or three staff for the first few years of running, basically. Uh, by January 2014, that got up to um, 16 staff. The company became a limited company in 2009. Um, and by February last year, um, we were in a position to move to much bigger offices than we had, which allowed us to actually physically expand. Um, and so by the end of last year, we had 45 staff in total, including three trainees. So why did we need to think about having trainees in the first place? Well, um, there are a number of reasons. We had an increasing workload. Um, that meant we had larger jobs, so we just needed more people. We also needed people to specialise a little bit more. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, having trainees increases our capacity and our flexibility. Um, it's the chance for us to try and grow skills in-house so people learn the way that we do things because much as we like, might, might want to believe that we all do things the same way, we don't. Um, not that we don't all do them to the same standards, but we all have slightly different ways of approaching how we get to those standards. Um, so we can cut, tailor that training to both our methods and to the needs of the company. As I said, we had recruitment problems. I don't think that they were isolated to us. In fact, I know for certain that they weren't isolated to us. And that wasn't a problem getting applications, it was a problem in getting applications from people who had the level of experience we were asking for. Um, and finally, based on a quote that one of our trainees gave me, because it's a good thing to do, it is a good healthy thing to do to have a training programme in-house. Um, why, why would we not be able to do it? We are involved in teaching members of the public through lots of different media here, uh, forums here, we've got um, National Trust Open Days, we've got Community Archaeology Projects, we've got Open Days on sites. We, we spend a lot of our time teaching people about what we do, so it shouldn't be difficult to transfer that to teaching other archaeologists about what to do. So, how, how did we actually do it? Right, well, we very <coughs> explicitly said that what we didn't want to do was, was set out something that was a sneaky way of getting cheaper stuff. That's not what this is about. So partly because of that, and partly because what we were tailoring our training programme towards, we've kept it very short. It's a three-month training programme, um, and I'll show you that in a second. The idea being that three months is enough time to have that good grounding in field archaeology. We're taking, we were anticipating taking people who already had some experience, just not in commercial archaeology, um, and so it would be, give us enough time to, to get people to that first run on the ladder. Um, 
Making it short puts the emphasis back on us to make sure that we can uh, achieve that training. Um, as I said, it was aimed at people who had a genuine interest in archaeology and no commercial experience. So we did find that some of the people who've applied to us have got commercial experience. They just haven't got enough to be able to get a job. Um, and another job, um, you know, people have worked for commercial units as volunteers or they've worked on short-term projects, but it's not taking them over that time threshold that they need to, to get a, a, an archaeologist job somewhere else. And then we're getting stuck. And the, the aim of the plan is for us to train people up that we then give contracts to and we keep them. That's what we're trying to do. So, um, as I said, our company ethos is very much that everybody should learn the basics of everything and that we share the knowledge and skills within the company. So, for example, you can see here our flint specialist, Joshua Ho, giving a talk to everybody on a particular site about the flints that they were finding. Um, and actually, in that slide, you will see not only uh, the field staff, but also our office administration staff are, are being taught these skills too. So that everybody gets a better understanding of what everybody else does. We're not heavily departmentalised like will happen in a large unit. So staff get to carry out lots of different aspects of work. So for example, they will do GPS and total station sur survey. They'll use GIS to produce illustrations for reports. They'll help out with geophysical surveys. Um, they take their own site photos um, and so on. Now, I appreciate that that might go as we grow bigger but we're going to try and hold on to that as much as possible, that idea of sharing the knowledge and giving everybody experience of every aspect of what, what the process is. Um, training plans are put in place for staff to progress and change direction, but I'm just going to talk about our um, entrance level training plan at the moment. So we've got people on the, we've got someone on the training plan for becoming a geophysicist at the moment, and someone else in archives who's on the training plan. So, I can't really read that. Um, <laughs> There's a clearer slide in a second, don't worry. Um, so what do people get? Well, they get um, three pieces of paper. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, formal, it's a formal plan. It's straightforward taken from the IFA uh, template. It's linked to the National Occupational Standards. You get um, a series of outcomes. You get an activity plan, which basically just tells you what activities you're going to carry out in order to complete your traineeship. And it go can go into quite some detail for some of them. Um, so this, this is the basic outcome of what you're going to achieve. You're going to get to see a variety of different types of archival fieldwork, do surveying, do post-excavation, illustration, finds handling, and working in an archive. So by the end of that three months, you'll have had the chance to see every aspect of the, the company. And uh, the uh, actual task list that goes with it um, is well, this is it. So you can see that this is done over, over the course of the three months. The emphasis is on their field work, is on how much time people are actually going to spend outside. But within that, there are, as you can see, um, there's five days worth of training, of uh, survey training, for example. And obviously, we can alter this if the specific things we want people to learn more or less of, then we can change this around. Or, it, or indeed, if the trainees have specific strengths or <coughs> things that they need more help with when they first come to us. So, what are the problems? Right, the first one um, is really simple and basic. The training experience depends entirely on what work we've got on. Um, and in the extreme, this is we had to stop taking on trainees because we didn't have sufficient work to put people out on site. But um, something which I think slightly surprised us when we realised it had happened, I, I put up a picture of this site. I, I do want to sort of emphasise, this is a photograph that was taken for the press after the site had finished, people weren't actually working in it quite like that, although it was nearly that wet. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we had a small window of time which happened to overlap with one of our trainees' um, posts with us, where we were digging some what I might call unusual sites. And she, she happened to have been on all of these unusual sites. Um, so this site here, um, Brayford Wharf in Lincoln, um, the only purpose of this site was, was sampling. We were sampling the um, uh, a Mesolithic layer on a paleosaur. So there was no stratigraphy to take into account. There was no normal kind of recording. And she'd spent, uh, I think, two, three weeks on this site out of her 20 days of fieldwork. So she hadn't had the chance to do some of the things that we would have normally expected her to do. And it was only towards the end of her 
traineeship, which coincided with the end of his site, that we realised that she'd missed that. Big problem, which um, has been mentioned lots when people are talking about training, is trying to keep that balance between the trainees and uh, the trainers. Now, we're a small company, so we rely on half a dozen people to do most of the training. Um, if we've got, if you've got, if you're Molar and you've got a very large site, you can embed a, a lot of trainees in that site. If that's a reasonable term, um, <laughs> and you can make sure that everybody's getting um, the support that they might need. If you've only got four people on site, we, we really can't take that many people uh, for permanent staff members <coughs> on site. We really can't take that many trainees with them. Um, and because we're relying on a small number of core staff to do that training, that means if they're off sick or they're on holiday or they need something else, then there may be a gap in that, in that training process. The biggest problem though, I don't suppose it would be any surprise to anybody, is um, both giving and getting feedback. The whole training programme relies on getting good feedback from the site supervisors um, and uh, Following feedback from our trainees, <laughs> we're working on a kind of um, like a, a mini appraisal form, in effect, a sort of checklist that will happen at the end of each site, so we, we have a constant check on what people are actually doing, um, rather than trying to group it all together towards the end of the, the, the traineeship. Um, we're also going to, for the next round of trainees, they're going to have a formal monthly meeting with an appointed person. Because people tend to get moved around, so both because of the workload and so that they can learn different things, there was a danger that they weren't actually getting the consistency that we thought we could offer them, so, so we're going to work on that. Um, but obviously that fieldwork programme can make that difficult, because if somebody is working away for two and a half months, the chances to see them become uh, fewer. Um, we also need to make sure that everybody involved in the training plan understands its purpose. The difficulty, I think, with the, the tick box sign-off form that I showed you earlier is that there is a tendency for some people to see it as a race to complete those number of days, rather than to understand that it's not just about the time served, it's about the task done, and that those two tables that are in that plan need to be looked at together. And that means that the person signing it off has to understand that that's what they've got to wait and check for evidence of that skill having been achieved, not just that somebody spent three days on site. Um, and giving people, a, a, giving the staff a chance to build on and share their experiences in, is uh, vital, even if it's sometimes a bit scary for us. Um, I just should put this slide up here. This is one of our, our former trainees, she's now on a permanent contract. But um, just we've, we have a, a I say we have an annual lecture day. We've had one. We will be having an annual <laughs> lecture day, which gives the staff of all different levels a chance to talk to each other, give semi-formal presentations, we call it the Christmas lectures, about what they've been doing. And it's a really nice chance. It's completely unmonitored by, by the management staff. People just talk about whatever they want to. Um, and it's a really nice chance for people to be able to feed back and, and tell good, good and bad things to their colleagues. Um, the last problem we've had it was the problem was one of the problems that we were having with the recruitment anyway, which is we're talking about a three-month training plan. It's very difficult to move somewhere and get a three-month housing contract, and there's a very practical problem there that I'm not really sure how we get around, um, and I think that holds true for short-term field contracts too. So, um, so is it working? It's all very well me telling you all this, but if it doesn't work, it's uh, well. It's your time, isn't it? Right, um, since January 2014, we've taken on 10 trainees. Um, some of these, a couple of these started before we had the formal training plan, so I don't have uh, as much information about them also before I started there, so I don't, know, don't have as much information. Um, two of those trainees started with the company first off as short term volunteers. They wanted to, to work as a volunteer, they came in for a week, they tried, tried things out for a bit. Um, and then they said that they were interested and they kind of moved up through that route. Um, six out of ten people have been given contracts as project archaeologists. I, I've worded that badly because it makes it look like four people didn't complete their training plans. I just mean that six out of ten of them got contracts. And of those, four are still with the company. Uh, two are currently out in the field. Two have specialised within the company. And uh, one is, uh, sorry, of those six people, one has left for a non field work related promotion outside the company, and one's currently taking a break from archaeology, but we're hoping that they might come back to us when they're ready to. 
out of all of those 10 traineeships, there's only been one that didn't work out at all. And there was one person whose contracts we couldn't extend. Actually, there were two people whose contracts we couldn't convert at the end of their traineeships because we didn't have the workload at that particular time. One of those we subsequently have been able to take on, and he's working with us again now. Um, so, as I said, it's all very well me telling you all this, but these are genuine things that I, when I asked our current, our current and former trainees to send me what they thought about the scheme, they were very open and said, as I said before, that, that we needed to be better about how we did our feedback, we need to be a bit more formal about that. Um, I think in our desire to keep it, um, I was going to say, light, informal, we'd actually overdone that a little bit. We need to, we need to for formalise things a bit more. But the good thing is that, um, that they've all said that they've got, had a very positive experience with it. I think for the discussion, one of the things maybe we should think about is that almost all of these people have said they wouldn't have got into archaeology if they hadn't had this. Now, I find that a little bit frightening because they're all very, very good, very valuable employees. And, um, and if we don't have any other way of getting people that foot on the ladder, then, then we're, losing, we're losing skills that we shouldn't be. So, in conclusions, what do we do next? Right, right. our numbers of trainees are small. We're a small company. We can only take on a small number of people at any one time. Unfortunately, we're not going to solve the training um, and part, other pathways into archaeology single-handedly. But maybe if we all did it, we could. I mean, I don't know how. I'm sure lots of people are doing similar things, actually. Um, and I think a 60% retention rate is pretty good. As I said at the beginning, our applications show that there's... Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> we get shout out. We get shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, applications show that there's both national and international interest in trainee posts, and uh, I think that's something we should discuss in a bit as well. Um, because we, especially with the people who are applying from other countries, quite often they do have a lot of, of hands on field work experience. They don't have UK commercial experience, which is what a lot of job adverts require. Um, Yes, it needs time and investment, but it doesn't need a disproportionate amount of time or investment compared with what you get back at the end of it. And uh, the last point I put up here um, was really, I think, Jim, Jim and the fiction read. Um, I said, should we start earlier? Should we be actually trying to make sure that people get that first three months before they've left university, in, embedded in commercial units in some way as trainees? Now, I've put that up there as a question because we have actually tried, and we didn't have, we had one applicant, and they only wanted one month's work. So I've, we have, as a company, advertised paid placements and, and not had any take up on that. So I'd be interested to know what, if anybody can give us any feedback on why they think that might have happened or what we could do better about that. Because we'd be certainly very willing to, to look at trying to do that. Okay. And uh, just finally, just say thank you to everybody who helped with the, the talk and all the people who support each other because ultimately this kind of training relies on, on having a team that works as a team and we're very lucky to do that. Thank you. <laughs>